1947 will long be remembered as the year of the great controversy. Will they be long or will they remain short? But the style makers win, as usual, with their lengthy arguments in favor of the new look. Across the Dominion, Madame Nature fashions a lengthy garment that is wide and deep. She also presents a formidable bill taken out in disrupted communications and in bogged down transportation during a record snowstorm. Main railroad lines on the prairies are snowed under for 60 hours before tracks are cleared and trains break through. Dozens of isolated communities receive food and medical necessities from the air as a gigantic battle is staged against time to clear essential traffic arteries. Canada dons the full robes of nationhood. In a memorable ceremony at the Supreme Court in Ottawa, citizenship certificates are presented to a representative group of Canadians. Previously, they had all been classed as British subjects with no legal right to the term Canadian. But in 1947, all naturalized and native-born residents of the Dominion automatically received the right to call themselves Canadian citizens. A royal welcome awaits 18-year-old Barbara Ann Scott as she brings back to her native Ottawa the European and the world's figure skating championships. Barbara Ann's high ideals of sportsmanship capture the fancy of everybody. She takes time out to turn down scores of professional offers and then is off to defend another of her amateur titles on her flashing skates. In the auditorium of her native Ottawa, she puts on a brilliant display to retain her North American title, won in 1946. Eight thousand devotees of the graceful sport see their favorite win the judge's nod and receive the coveted trophy from the hands of the Governor General, Viscount Alexander. A special edition of Canadian Stamps commemorates the 100th anniversary of the birth of the man who annihilated space with a wonderful invention, Dr. Alexander Graham Bell. In the Bell Homestead at Brantford, Ontario, the first telephone was born. No one dreamed in those days that the crude instrument of the gay 90s would become the mighty network of today which sends a whisper to the far ends of the globe. The mountainside at Mont Saint Anne, Quebec, provides the background for the Dominion Ski Championships. Sensations of the meet are the Wirtle twins of Montreal, Rhoda and Rona. Both in downhill and in slalom, they always let their left foot know what the right is doing. Coveted places on Canada's 1948 Olympic team are an additional spur to contestants in all events. After a brilliant exhibition, to Rhoda goes the slalom title, and to her twin sister Rona, the downhill event. Even a blizzard has no effect on the jumpers, especially when a Dominion Championship is at stake. They leave all the shivering to the spectators. Leaping 162 and 164 feet in bad weather, Tom Mobratton of Vancouver becomes the new jumping champ. Signs of revolt over rising prices are spearheaded by the Dominion Small Fry. They say candy sellers are sabotaging the sweet tooth, and what this country needs most is a good five-cent chocolate bar. Across the country, over a hundred leaders of the Lollipop Brigade charge that the higher prices are unfair to Canada's candy chewers. So they stage the most unusual strike on record. But the trouble with these walkouts is that there is always somebody who's ready to dip into the piggy bank and let the gang down. The Stanley Cup, symbolic of the world's hockey championship, once again is up for competition. Montreal Canadiens and Toronto Maple Leafs battle it out for top place. In the first 25 seconds of play, the Canadiens score a surprise goal. The fastest game in the world, played by the fastest teams on ice, provides a thrill a minute for the fans who have their money on the league leaders. one all after the second period, the battle is hot and furious for that hard-to-get marker. <laughs> In 
In the closing minutes of the last period, Leafs ring the bell to win 2-1 to one the coveted World Hockey Championship. The President of the United States pays a state visit to his good friends and neighbors in Canada. President Truman addresses Parliament. We intend to aid those who seek to live at peace with their neighbors without coercing or being coerced, without intimidating or being intimidated. We intend to uphold those who respect the dignity of the individual, who guarantee to him equal treatment under the law, and who allow him the widest possible liberty to work out his own destiny and achieve success to the limit of his capacity. We count Canada in the forefront of those who share these objectives and ideals. Another centenary is celebrated with all the pomp and religious pageantry of the Roman Catholic Church. Thousands gather in the Marian Congress at the Capitol to take part in a great ceremony which honors the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Ottawa Diocese. Designed as a spectacle, the Marian Congress features religious plays at the repository together with midnight and daylight masses. Peoples from many parts of the globe attend the Lansdowne Park function. James Cardinal McGuigan, the papal legate, together with nine cardinals and 140 archbishops and bishops from seven countries, pray for everlasting world peace. A large-scale oil rush is on in western Canada. The Leduc area of Alberta is probed for the precious fluid and proves productive. With Canada producing but 10% of its oil consumption, great official interest is shown in the new strike. A rush of drilling has come to the country. While on his western trip, the Governor General looks over the area. Viscount Alexander hears of many farmers reaping fortunes as thousands of gallons of much needed crude oil pour from their farmyards. After being used by the armed forces for six years, the Canadian National Exhibition prepares to open once again. Hundreds of workmen rush to renovate the buildings of the world's greatest annual exhibition for its post-war opening. At a ceremony in the band shell, Prime Minister Mackenzie King gives the signal that opens the gates to the public for the first time since 1941. An all-time attendance record is chalked up for the X. Once again, the popular password is Meet Me at the Fountain. Fifty-six swimmers hit the waters of Lake Ontario to start the 10-mile CNE Marathon Swim. The winner will win $5,000 in addition to the World Swimming Championship for the distance. Setting a grueling pace, Toronto truck driver Ben Gazzle becomes the second Toronto boy to win since the 1928 inauguration of the Exhibition Marathon Swim. Also in the swim are the DeLovelys out to win the Miss Canada Beauty Contest, especially as far as the mere males are concerned. Hamilton, Ontario plays host to the contest this year, and this is one time the host gets all the breaks. There is a $2,000 scholarship at stake, as well as a trip to Atlantic City. And they both go to lovely Miss Margaret Marshall of Toronto. Not content with being the most beautiful girl in Canada, Miss Marshall brings home third prize in the Miss America contest in Atlantic City, against heavy competition from girls of every state. Not to be outdone, mere men also display the body beautiful as they stage a muscle-bound contest for Mr. Canada at Montreal. Elected the Canuck, Baron of the Biceps is René Léger, and he gets a cup to prove it. In one of the most thrilling gridiron struggles in the long history of the Canadian Rugby Union, Toronto Argonauts meet Winnipeg Blue Bombers for the Canadian Football Championship. 19,000 spectators watch a titanic struggle for possession of the Grey Cup between the Eastern and the Western champions. The Blue Bombers are underdogs in the betting, but, starred by Bob Sandberg, they take a 9-1 to lead at the end of the first half. In the second half, Argos put up a desperate bid to win and tie the score. The most disputed play of the year loses Winnipeg possession of the ball in the final minutes of play. 
Joe Crowell kicks over the Winnipeg goal to win 10-9, the Grey Cup for Toronto Argonauts. Not long before Christmas every year, good St. Nicholas comes to town. He brings with him all his happy people from the land of make-believe. Although his bag of toys is very small for some countries in the world, Canada is close to his North Pole home. He comes to us well laden with good cheer. As the head man of the Christmas season greets his admiring flock, Canadians leave behind the events of 1947 and look forward to the headlines of 1948.